So, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a great pleasure for me to be here, uh, celebrating Freinel and his, his work. Um, this, in this session, which uh, touches upon uh, theory of flight and a few technical aspects relating to Augustin Fresnel and um, and his work, and we will we will hear uh, from uh, is it three or four four excellent speakers, um, three professors, and one uh, speaker who doesn't hold the title of uh, a professor, but certainly is. Uh, very knowledgeable on the light and optics topics from a practical industrial point of view, um, applying what Franel came up with in real in real world uh, real world. So, uh, the first speaker is Professor Bernard Met. Is that correct? Met. Okay. <laughs> Who is Professor Emeritus at the University of Lille? in uh, history and epistemology of physics, um, a true historian. He is also the founder and first director of the Forum de Science here in France. And uh, he's won a number of uh, scientific prizes over the years. And, and his work includes a number of books, publications, um, including The History of Rainbow, The History of Crystals, the history of light from Plato to uh, the photon, and the a history of images, images of the world from Hesiod to Stephen Hawking. So uh, this is a true historian. So, Professor Met, you have the floor. Oui, j'ai un écran devant, je n'avais pas. Okay, so there's a screen in front of me. You know, here you have the home where Augustin Fresnel, uh, his home, the Chateau de Breuil, and Augustin Fresnel's mother was called Mary May, and Mrs. Mary May, Mrs. Fresnel Mary May, had a brother called Léonard Mérimée, who was the grandfather of the author Prosper Mérimée, so it's a family of some renown. And Léonard Mérimée was the president of the Academy of Fine Arts in France in the period of interest to us here. And this may be important later on. Here you have the Oratorian School of Caen, which also played an important role. This is where Augustin Fresnel did his secondary studies, or what we would call secondary studies today, under the Ancien Régime, before the Revolution, which had an education system linked with the different, uh, where there was very little teaching of science, and one of the, the, the few uh, schools that taught science were the oratorians who taught the ideas of Descartes. So Fresnel studied Descartes. The physics of the time was, at that time, was Newton, but not much was known of Newton at the time. He was introduced here by Voltaire, and they taught about Newton only in two places, in France, an engineering school in Misier, where there was, where Monge was a student, then a professor, and Newton was often also taught at the Lafayre Military Academy, where there was a young pupil by the pupil by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. So so this is under the Ancien Regime before the revolution, very little scientific teaching, but Fresnel did get some scientific teaching and learnt about Descartes. What did Fresnel learn? He learnt 
he learned that the world is full of ether and that ether is made up of uh, vortices like this which turn around a center where generally there is a star so here we are in a vortex where ether is rotating around the sun and pulling with it the seven planets visible to the naked eye which put up some resistance and rotate on themselves and so it's a mechanical system in which the world is full and is full of a substance called ether. So Augustin Fresnel, in his secondary studies, learnt all this. Then he was admitted to the Polytechnic School. So, founded at the time of the revolution, and Bonaparte made it a fee-paying military academy. So here, the French Revolution gave more power to the scientists with the ideas of Newton, who, so with Monge and Lavoisier and Laplace, especially in physics. And what did uh, Fresnel get taught? He had a very poor a uh, very poor physical teacher, physics teacher who taught Fresnel that the world is empty and that masses attract each other. And this very bad physics professor, physics teacher that Fresnel had, did not convince the young Fresnel at all. And 23, 24-year-old Augustin Fresnel decided that uh, Newton probably wasn't up to much either. So he was very good at experimentation, very good at mathematics. But his ranking at the Polytechnic School wasn't very good. And he was sent to Nyons in the Drôme in the southeast of France to work as a supervisor on the building of the road between Nyons and uh, Montgenev, and he did that. Very well. He oversaw the construction works. He kept track of the accounts, the works. He, he conducted the works, but he was already suffering from tuberculosis. He didn't have any friends, girlfriends. He was in Nyons, a long way from the Normandy of his youth. He was bored, and so he spent pretty much all his free time noting down ideas. Ideas about politics, about religion. He was very religious, very much a royalist. And also his ideas uh, consisted in inventing things and such and so on. And he sent that to his, his invention to his uncle, Mérimée, the nom Mérimée, who found a member of the Academy, Gay Lussac, who thought that this uh, invention was great. But the only problem was that if they followed Fresnel's process, the production would cost four times more than at present. And so next he wanted to show that Newton was wrong. So how did he set about doing this? He wanted to show that light is not made up, as Newton said, of, uh, of uh, corpuscles uh, propagating in a vacuum and having not read any of the founding books of physics, Fresnel said to himself that if light is propagated through the ether, necessarily it's in the form of waves, and the waves must uh, move around any shadows. And so he had the idea of looking at how the shadow of a hair behaves when there is a, a point light source. So he took some honey, he put it in a hole, he lit it, and it uh, formed a point source of light. And what he saw, and here you have the first drawings that Fresnel sent to his uncle, Leonard, Leonard Merimé, which showed that it's true that there are there is a 
series of light intensities and of the darkness inside and outside the geometric shadow. And he was very happy because he thought he had demonstrated that light moves around shadow. He, and he wrote this to Leonard Mérimé, who passed this on to François Rago, a member of the Academy. And he immediately wrote to Fresnel and said, you are starting a revolution in physics and in science. Keep at it. Keep going. So Fresnel did continue. So this was in 1814. And in 1814, what happened? Napoleon uh, headed off to the island of Elba. And Fresnel was happy to see the Bourbon royal family restored. Shortly after, Napoleon came back. And Fresnel went to see the prefect and said he wanted to, 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 to sign up to fight against the tyrant, against Napoleon. And he, he wanted to defend the royalty against, uh, the, against Napoleon. So he went off to the army under Maréchal Ney, who then uh, supported Napoleon. And Fresnel didn't want to, to, to continue in the army if they were going to support Napoleon. So he was sent off into exile in his, his mother's house to keep him out of harm's way. And then the Ministry for the Interior brought him to Paris where he met Arago. And Arago said, read Regans, read Newton. But Fresnel couldn't read English and so went off to, to, to stay with his mother and there he continued with the encouragement of Arago to do large numbers of experience with drops of honey, with micrometers made by the village blacksmith. And he sent essays off to Arago saying things, explaining the fringes I showed you there very simply, and that light is made up of waves, which are as simple as possible, sinusoidal waves, and that what we see is the superimposition of waves emitted by the source and reflected by each of the edges of the screen, for example, of the hair. And Arago read the, the essay to the Academy of Science, and the Academy of Science in, in 1815 decided to award a prize to anybody. So 1820, sorry, in 1819, sorry, that a prize would be awarded to anyone who could explain how rays of light were bypassing or, or, or moving around shadow. And Fresnel took part in the, the competition of the Academy of Science, especially as Argo, now that Napoleon had been sent off to St. Helena, and, and Argo got him a grant so that he could continue his experiments and he sent him an, a dissertation in which there is this diagram um, containing a very large number of very precise experiments which had been conducted with some very impressive analytical calculations to check all this. So he considered that Newton was totally off the mark, so he attacked Newton very violently in the, at the very beginning of his dissertation, even though the Academy was won over to the ideas of Newton, and which was going to be awarding the prize. There were about three members of the Academy who weren't in favor of Newton. There was Arago, Ampere, and Gay-Lussac, and all the others were Newtonians. So the Newtonians looked at 
Prinel's experiments and calculations that Prinel had made, in particular the former maths professor of, of uh, Prinel at Polytechnique, Poisson, did the calculations and found that there was something strange in the calculations and that if Prenel was right, there were some practical things which were quite impossible. But I won't go on to the subject which will be presented by Pierre Lénat afterwards. And you'll see that Prenel wasn't entirely wrong, and he won the prize. A Newtonian, an academy full of Newtonians gave the prize to somebody who was proving that Newton was wrong, and that light spread and uh, about how light spread. So in Fresnel's publication, there was one thing which is not explained, which is the polarization of light. What is the polarization of light? This was explained by a short, a short time earlier, and was discovered by Christian Huygens in 1712. Here we have some diagrams from 1792, sorry, by Huygens, when the light arrives in a crystal, it, there is double refraction, and with the second crystal here, it, which is rotated on itself, this generally forms four rays, except in certain positions where the ray is not doubled, is not split a second time, and Huygens, said, I really don't understand this, and I just explained this by corpuscles, which were guided by reflection and refraction. But Fresnel couldn't explain this, and so he spent his time conducting experiments on the polarization of light, and with Arago, he discovered, for example, the chromatic polarization by crystals lit by polarizers and analyzers which are either parallel or crossed to identify the minerals present in rock, their refractive indexes, indices. He made a lot of discoveries on um, this, but without giving any explanations. Until 1823, when Fresnel said there is something which is important. Until now, light has been perceived as being with uh, waves like sound, and the vibrations of sound are in the same direction as the propagation. The mo air molecules vibrate in that direction, but that can't be the case here. When we have an experiment like this, because you see that when we turn, if we turn the second crystal, there's only one direction which remains constant, and that is the direction which is perpendicular to the crystal. So if the vibrations of the light were in the direction of the propagation of the light, we wouldn't be able to explain this. So this proves that light is associated with transverse vibrations that are per perpendicular to the direction of the propagation. And Fidel published this result. Arago said to him, I can't follow you anymore there on that. You're going too far. Why? Because, because if light, uh, there are waves of light, all physical explanations were mechanical explanations with light being propagated through ether, the ether that fills the world. And the Earth rotates in the ether without any resistance. And the longitudinal longitudinal vibrations are spread are propagated through water, through air, through ether, but transverse vibrations mechanically cannot be transmitted except in viscous jelly, which means that the ether is like uh, viscous jelly and that the ether, that the earth is rotating freely without friction in viscous jelly, and that's, and that's a bit too much for me to accept. So Poisson then came along, and Poisson 
clashed very violently with Fresnel, saying mechanically that is totally impossible. And Poisson and, and he said, if you use your mathematical skills to understand physics, uh, you can't use your mathematical skills to say such silly things. And that here we have to assume that the ether moves freely through the globe, and then you will understand that the Earth can uh, circulate. So the opponents of Fresnel said, Fresnel has uh, invented an ether which is not possible. That is like an ether for, for cobblers, because Scottish cobblers have a glue where if you put in a bead, it can pass through without any problem. But then Fresnel died. Ether and with his ether could let these transverse vibrations move through, and it was Aragu who had to ask Fuku and Fito to do experiments to measure the speeds of light in water, because the corpuscular theory of Newton stated that light must go more should go more quickly through water than through light, whereas a the wave theory of Chenel suggested it would be slower in water than in light. So they used different me measurements to measure the speed of a light in water, and they discovered that uh, uh, light does uh, is transmitted more slowly through water than through air, and that Mr. Chenel was in fact right. So after the death of Arago, in about 1864, Maxwell, who was working on electricity and magnetism, calculated the effect of electromagnetism and considered electromagnetism as being a field that uh, spreads in which the ether just provides a support. And he broke, he broke with the tradition of physicists who always want to explain everything in terms of mechanics, and he did calculations, and the results of his calculations did demonstrate that electromagnetism linked to transverse, was linked to transverse vibrations transmitted through the ether, which was just a support at the same speed as light. So why? And light, therefore, uh, is spread electromagnetically. And so Fresnel found his place in Maxwell's electromagnetism, and in about 1910, Louis de Breuil, who was born at the Chateau of Breuil, combined the description of light and matter for the centenary of the death of Fresnel and did a speech which he concluded by saying, until now we wanted uh, the, uh, the objects to be part of electromagnetism, but now in fact it's the methods of the wave theory that seem to be able to help us to understand electromagnetism, whereas the relativists are giving up on the idea of ether. And that I think is what Alain Espy will be talking about. Well, thank you, uh, Professor. I told you he was a professor and a historian, right? Um, very, very interesting. I love it. Very interesting topics. All the names that you mentioned there, you know, uh, Newton and all the other scientists that uh, we 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 know of still. He this was, this was a community of uh, scientific community of uh, master brains uh, at the time. And also, I think uh, that uh, your your speech revealed that uh, Fresnel is just not just about a prism of glass. There's a depth here of understanding of physics. Oh, yes, yes. No, no, no. Oh, that's me. Okay. They know who I am. 
this is the next one, I think. So, um, yes, the the, uh, the the deep understanding of uh, of, of theory and uh, and physics uh, leads to great results at the end of the day and uh, and good solutions. So, uh, moving on, uh, the next speaker is also a professor emeritus. Uh, from uh, from um, oh, sorry, I lost my. There we are. Um, from uh, Paris uh, Cité University and uh, Paris Observatory. Um, if I, I I took this from uh, Wikipedia, so if I have the the correct, uh, <laughs> yeah, if if I have the correct information, the uh, correct. Uh, professor, um, uh, Professor Lina is an astrophysicist. Is that right? Where are you? Oh, there you are. Okay, <laughs> and has worked extensively on the development of infrared astronomy, as well as looking into space. Um, the the European Very Large Telescope uh, built in Chile, and uh, Professor Lena will speak on the Fresnel Bright Point which is a phenomenon discovered by Bafrenel in the beginning of the 19th century. And so now we wonder, what is Fresnel Bright Spot? There it is. Okay. You have the floor. Good morning. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good morning, everybody. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be here today. I was very happy to uh, participate in the launch of the Fresnel Year at the Ministry of the Sea in the spring, with Ala Aspe, in fact. And I am delighted to meet you here again for this conclusion. My contribution will be brief to prepare this huge overview of the theory of light that will be defined by Ala Aspe and I will just take a little time to talk to you a little bit about history and its extension today, this bright spot. From his very youth, Augustin Fresnel was, was well, he wasn't very bright at school, in fact. He didn't do very well. But he had qualities in terms of imagination and experimentation, which were absolutely fabulous. And for someone who contributed in our program called La Main à la Patte, and it was well illustrated by the children of Cordois in the film you saw a little bit earlier, it was extremely interesting to be able to emphasize that a child must be encouraged. And if a child is encouraged, well, because in, uh, when he was nine years of age, his classmates said that he was a man of genius. So they were obviously more clear-sighted than many of his teachers. So as you know, he was born in Normandy at the Breuil family chateau in 1788, and he studied, as was reminded to us by the previous speaker, and he studied at École Polytechnique. His teachers were Monge, Poisson, of course, who we'll talk about again, and uh, and Adrien Legendre, who are all absolutely exceptional mathematicians, he was appointed in an almost to an almost ordinary service, like the graduates of Polytechnique at the time. Then, of course, there was the Hundred Days and the Restoration, and he was quite bored in his position. And Arago, in his fabulous speech at the time of the hundredth anniversary of the birth of Renel. Uh, and said, I hope that in 2027, uh, he said, I hope that we'll be able to celebrate the bicentennial, oh, sorry, of the death of Renel. Uh, and that was said in 1927, and we therefore in 2027. And he he was always looking for uh, experiments to carry out in his ward where he was working. So he was working on irrigation canals. He was very bored. His work was not fascinating to him. And the message he sent to his uncle, he said, this is an extremely painful experience. I find it boring to lead people, and I don't think I'm good at it. And Arago said in his speech, in tribute after the death of Fresnel, in his tribute to Fresnel, he said, a man who was extremely rigorous with great scientific rigor 
irrespective of the simplicity and the boredom of the task at hand. And all of that uh, tells us how he um, was working at that time and how he published his first essay on the diffraction of light. Uh, the Fresnel archives, his memoirs, are at the Academy of Science. And like all of you, I think it was ex great emotion for me to be able to read them, including his notebooks in which he, which he wrote all of his experiences. So he focused on the issue of light. And you have the two uh, proposals that were made, whether it was uh, light, was waves, or, or uh, whether it was a wave or a particle, in fact. And uh, the word interference came up, which we use for the first time today, comes from Jung. But Fresnel uh, did not know the work of Jung. It will be his meeting with Arago that will allow him to become aware of the work. Oh, sorry, it's Jung and not Jung, Jung. And um, so we said everything that was, uh, well, already mentioned about this essay, this memoir, The Diffraction of Light. And it was a very explicit topic when he presented his candidacy. So explaining the phenomenon of diffraction by precise experiments and find conclusions on these phenomena by mathematical induction, which Young did not do 20 years beforehand, describe the movement of rays in their passage near bodies. So you see how this was expressed in terms of the competitive examination he then entered. Um, and his essay showed a consequence of diffraction of light, which I detail here, which is the bright spot, the Fresnel bright spot. Today it bears a name which could be, it could be the Meraldi Fresnel Arago Poisson bright spot. So following literature, you find one or several of these names. Now, why is that? Because there's a, an affiliation, really, as is often the case in science and physics. Filippo Maraldi was the nephew of Jean-Baptiste Cassini, who was a great astronomer in, in, in Bologna. And Colbert and Louis XIV had actually called him to Paris to lead the brand new Paris Observatory. And Colbert <coughs> had had that built. Cassini was the director of that, and he called his nephew, who already had significant scientific skill, to come to Paris. And his nephew uh, became an astronomer at uh, the Paris Observatory and actually completed his career in Paris and made many different observations, discovered comets, and he did many interesting things. And in 1723, he focused on light. And he found and saw a strange phenomenon that he described, but that was forgotten for almost a century after that. It, he uh, light, lit up a screen with a hole using sunlight, and on the alignment of the ray going through the light, he put a circular mask to, to hide the screen. And on a screen behind the mask, perfectly aligned with it, at the center of the shadow of the mask, he saw a bright spot. Now, he couldn't understand what was happening, so he described it, and that's where it stayed. It remained at that. And then Augustin Fresnel, having uh, entered this competitive examination for the Academy, in his essay gave a complete theory of diffraction, which, as the topic required, provided a mathematical argument which neither Moraldi nor Young had done. And... Poisson, who was an outstanding mathematician and a member of the jury, the panel of examiners, said, well, this young man looks like he understands mathematics. Let me calculate the, the, the shadow of a circular disk. And I realized the result of the calculation is the figure at the top left, uh, right-hand side, sorry, is around the shadow, there are the diffraction fringes, which is not really surprising because the diffraction fringes of a, a hair are, are, well, clearly appeared and had been analyzed in Frenet's essay. But at the center, the bright spot. Now, that was totally absurd. And, of course, it was, well, it was a source of great laughter and humor for the Newtonians 
who said, well, no, there cannot be a particle in the center, so Frédéric must be wrong. And Arago had a reaction, which was the reaction of a genuine scientist and physicist, whereas he himself was actually Newtonian in his conception of light. Uh, and we saw that it would take time for him to actually completely agree until the measurement of the, the speed of light by Foucault, say, saying, well, let's do the experiment. It's quite a simple experiment, in fact. And what does he show his colleagues? He shows that in the center of the shadow, there is indeed a bright spot. This bright spot results directly uh, from the correct mathematical writing of the pathway of light diffracted by the edge of the screen, the circular mask. And why exactly in the center? Because the center of the screen where the bright spot is formed is equidistant from the points of the periphery of the mask. So the light diffracted by each of these points arrives exactly at the same time in the center. Hence, an interference, a constructive interference figure, as the physicists would say, and the bright spot. And for the points that are next to it, the effect of the diffraction uh, is, well, it remain, there remains a little bit of intensity. That is what the image below shows. It's very exactly what we observe. So I would have liked to, of course, redo the experiment here, but we didn't have time to do that. But for the people in this room who would like to make sure that Fresnel was right, well, here is a reference that would allow you at home uh, for very little expense to redo the experiment. So you can see the equipment you need is not very complicated. So I would like to show you now the bright spot, the Fresnel bright spot. It has now posterity. It's, mo it's moved on in time, and it's, it's uses that are quite simple to understand. In 2017, an asteroid called Palma, which is uh, located at this point in time uh, at approximately uh, three and a half times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, well, this asteroid, Palma, uh, uh, moved in front of a quasar, which is a lum luminous point which is extremely far, not in our galaxy, and this l luminous point is extremely bright in terms of the wavelength of visible light, but in particular in radio frequency wavelength. A radio telescope located on Earth in West Virginia in the U.S., that is the little map you have. So it's near Brewster, near the Canadian border. And it is on the calculated trajectory of the shadow of this asteroid. And the asteroid, um, the light, it behaves in exactly the same way like a circular mask, a circular screen we were describing earlier. It's 200 kilometers in diameter, so it's a large asteroid, and uh, and it will be of a comparable size in terms of the shadow. And because the terrestrial screen is not entirely perpendicular, the trace of the shadow is a little bit of it's a little bit oval, so it's the ellipse you can see, and it moves quite quickly over the surface of the Earth. Now, all you have to do is measure that shadow. And the experiment allowed us, well, an experience allowed us in 2017 to prove the uh, luminous intensity that you have here with the Fresnel right spot obtained in a configuration that Maraudi could, of course, never have imagined. And, of course, the story doesn't stop there. And in the three minutes I have left, I am going to give you a new version, a modern version, a futuristic version of the bright spot. You know that the astronauts are very focused today on exoplanets, so planets that are similar, uh, well, different, but of the same nature than the planets of the solar system, but located around other stars. We know several of, we know of several thousand today. The problem of the observation with these objects is that they are very close to a star, which is much brighter uh, and much, uh, much, much, much brighter, uh, sometimes a million or a billion times brighter than the planet itself. 
So the difficulty of observing the characteristics, the properties of these exoplanets is huge. It's, it's very difficult, and it's of great interest in optics and, and the terms, in terms of the instruments we build. So one of the difficulties that is that is is to hide the star to actually be able to see the the, the planets around it, and we need to create a coronographic mask. Now, the problem is that you, if you put this mask too close, you're not going to succeed in properly hiding the star while properly seeing the planets. So then the bit of a crazy idea came up is to have the mask a hundred thousand kilometers away from the telescope. Put the telescope up in space allow uh, the mask to navigate and, and the telescope at the same time, so in a, in a synchronous approach, and, and avoid the Fresnel bright spot being too bright. So, in fact, r through an, a very astute optical solution, reduce the quantity of light diffracted by the edge of the mask the screen. Now, all of this is calculated very well with the uh, Fresnel equations. So we give the, the screen or the mask, uh, which is going to have a, di a, di a dimension of 50 meters. It's a petal form, and these petals are optimal to be able to reduce the light coming uh, onto the telescope, and the telescope will be at 700,000, sorry, I made a mistake with the zero. It's in fact 70,000 kilometers. Sorry, it says 700,000 on the screen, but it's 70,000 from the screen. Well, it's not attached, of course. So the two instruments have to navigate together. And at the bottom, you have the breakdown of the light uh, in the telescope. Uh, you can see the blue. Well, the blue is uh, a diameter of three meters. The diameter of the telescope is four meters. So uh, the telescope is going to receive receive the light from the Maraldi Fresnel Poisson Arago bright spot. And he's, they're going to, the, the telescope then receives information that will allow to calculate the, well, we can calculate, of course, the position of the mask, the screen related to the telescope, and send a signal that would stabilize the line that connects them precisely. Of course, the star is thus hidden and the distance is such that the planets can be observed. This magnificent mission should take place around 2040. It's been calculated, well, it's been studied right now by, by NASA to, be, to plan. And I hope that the instrument will be called Fresnel. Fresnel, in the space of nine years, produced a revolution on the design of light. The uh, Science Academy in its session of the 12th of May, 1823, he was elected to replace Mr. Charles, who was a physicist who's known for the hydrogen balloon that took off from the Tuileries a few decades before that. And out of 52 voters, Mr. Fresnel was elected by 52 people, so a unanimous vote. And we have that in the archives. We have the, the report, uh, the minutes of the unanimous vote of the French Academy of Science. And he continued to work, and he has some photocopies of his notebooks. And they are available at the French Institute, Institut de France. And it, these notebooks were sold by Fresnel's brother, uh, to, uh, 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 and then they were actually sold on to other owners. And 50 years after Fresnel died, they were actually then put up for sale, and the Institute bought them at that time, and they're extremely valuable now and uh, really interesting and valuable for all of those who have an interest in the history of science. On the 14th of July, 1827, 1827, Augustin Fresnel died at uh, Ville d'Avray, and his friend Arago had just before that given him a medal. This medal was uh, by the Royal Society, the Rumford Medal. He was elected at the, as a member of the Royal Society, which and were not the best, huh? uh, was outstanding. He was elected to the uh, British Academy, the Royal Society, at a time when the relationship between France and England, well, wasn't, uh, well, let's, pay, let's say at its best point in time. Uh, and if you look at what was written about him in 1927, 
the tribute to him. Uh, and even in uh, 1830, Arago said, we know something, we know something, despite the fact that Fresnel did not live very long. That was Arago in 1830, just after the death of Augustin Fresnel. And Debray, Debray then wrote in 1927, for the centenary of the death of Fresnel, wrote a beautiful text, and there's a short photograph of that there on the screen. Uh, there is a history of the bright spot, and it's not over yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. What a takeaway from your, your lecture. A lot of interesting aspects. Of course, uh, we forgive you forgetting a factor of 10 in astrophysics. Uh, one zero out of, you know, we're talking about exoplanets, so distances are very large. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, one of the things that I noticed from uh, several speakers now is the importance of mentors. Uh, his uncle, he's writing to his uncle, and he's uh, being encouraged by his uncle and some other fellow scientists. Uh, carry on, young man. And uh, that made him made him great with this, together with his, uh, his own, uh, of course, intelligence, but uh, also enthusiasm uh, to, to, that drove him. And again, uh, the depth of what uh, Fresnel was doing is... Uh, far larger, and the importance is far larger than we could expect. We're talking about a lens, right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the next speaker, if I can open here, yeah, is Professor Alain Aspect, who is a professor at Institut d'Optique uh, and uh, at the University of Paris-Saclay. So, Professor Aspect graduated in physics in 1969, correct? Uh, and received his PhD uh, degree a couple of years later, 1971. So uh, he's uh, a bit old. <laughs> Maybe also a historian, I don't know, but uh, but he will uh, move us into a, a more recent part of uh, uh, of, of this more, more recent application of uh, of. Um, uh, or aspects of uh, of Fresnel. Um, he has studied the inter interesting topics such as Bell's inequalities, laser cooling of neutral atoms, uh, both Einstein condensate, so we are now up in Einstein times. And um, clearly, uh, Professor Aspect knows what he's talking about when it comes to quantum physics. And this is why he will talk about Fresnel and quantum physics. So, we have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, il faut remonter au début. Could perhaps go back to the beginning of the presentation. Okay, there we are. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Was, when I was invited here, uh, I was aware that most of the audience. Je parle anglais ou en français, au fait? En français. So, excuse me. The slides are in English, though. So, when I was invited here, The impression I rightly got, I think, was that most of the audience would be people who are familiar with lighthouses and with the work of Fresnel as an engineer and as an inventor. And for me, I'm a great admirer of Fresnel because when I was offered a chair at the Institut Optique, I gave it the name of the Augustin Fresnel chair because he is someone I have always admired. But I realized that there are really two communities who have completely different visions and sometimes almost exclusive of each other. In lighthouses, everyone knows he is a very great 
engineer and inventor and the physicists see him as a great physicist and many of him are totally unaware that he was a great inventor. They may have heard about the Fresnel lens. They're not aware that thanks to Fresnel, France dominated in the construction of lighthouses, if I have understood correctly. So ultimately, the pitch that we, as we say in English, the pitch for what I'm going to present here is that ultimately, today more than ever before, the, con the most fundamental concepts are giving rise to some extraordinary applications in quantum technologies today, which can be linked to the duality of, uh, to wave particle duality. Now, I have to start my timer, otherwise I'll, I'll just keep talking forever. You see, I've already stolen two or three minutes from you. That's, it's a little trick I have. So, light through the ages. In Egyptian times, as you can see, it was the sun sending multicolored flowers. An ancestor of the corpuscular theory of Newton with corpuscles of different colors. In the Middle Ages, it's what we would call the innovators in the Middle Ages, what they were interested in was engineering, and they invented a small object with, which is essential for some of us. You know, after a certain, when you arrive at a certain age, you, you need glasses, you need spectacles, and they invented spectacles in the Middle Ages, and as they invented these lenses, there were people who discovered that if you put lenses behind each other, you could create a microscope to or telescopes to see things which are infinitely large or infinitely small. In the 17th century, we return to some fundamental conceptual questions with the debate between Newton and Huygens. Newton pleading in favor of a theory of corpuscles and uh, Huygens for waves. Newton won, not because he was right, but because of his authority having, as one of the greatest scientists in history, with the rules of gravity, which explained the movement of the planet, which was a major problem to be resolved. So the prestige of Newton could not be questioned, and he used that to crush Huygens, who was relegated uh, and considered as somebody who had understood nothing, even though his theory was, in fact, excellent. So in the 19th century, we saw the, past, the triumph of the waves with two huge scientists, young in England, uh, polymath, a universal mind. He came close to deciphering hieroglyphics, also a physician, uh, really a universal mind, and he discovered interference and concluded quite rightly that light is a wave. But just in passing, whereas Fresnel was obsessed only with light, well, pretty much. And he came up with the full theory. Well, today, when we do wave optics, there is nothing new. It's all Fresnel's theory on birefringent, on birefringent crystals, uh, as mentioned by Professor Met. Nothing. When you're doing studying waves, the only thing that Fresnel did not know and could not know was what is the nature of the transverse vibration. He had con rightly concluded that there was a transverse vibration. The only thing he didn't understand was the nature of that, and it was only with Maxwell in 1865, who in his equation discovered a solution. Uh, he came up with the conclusion with the idea that his equations corresponded to, like the speed he calculated, was already known. So in 1900, a certain number of physicists thought that physics was complete, except 
Kelvin, but Meckelson said there was just a question of, of measuring things now. All the theories were already known. Kelvin identified two huge clouds or unclear subjects that would need to be studied because the two theories at the beginning of the 20th century that were going to clear the, those uh, things that were not clear were quantum physics and the theory of relativity. So at the beginning of the 20th century with Einstein in 1905, the particle model of light which had been defended by Newton, or the corpuscular theory, With Einstein, we had a new corpuscular theory of light. Einstein came up with the theater, the theory that light was particles with, according to the frequency of the waves. Nobody believed him until 1915, when the great physicist who measured the charge of the electron said, that he embarked on a series of experiments to show that Einstein was wrong and proved that Einstein was right. He was very good at experiments. He was perfectly honest, proved that Einstein was right. And the Nobel Prize was given to Einstein in 1922, or perhaps 2021, awarded in 2022, for the theory of light. So increasingly, with it became increasingly clear that light is formed of particles, but Einstein, even back in 1909, answered a question which seemed evident, that yes, light is made up of particles, but Young and Fresnel were far from being idiots. Their theory was excellent and they had proved that light was a wave. And how could the two be reconciled? In 1909, Einstein gave a presentation at the German uh, Society of Physics where he presented wave-particle duality, and it was Dubreuil who, 14 years later, who declared the same uh, thing for matter. So this wave-particle duality is something I will skip through quite quickly. For physicists, we need to be aware that the formula I have marked here, which was written by Einstein at his conference in 1909, is an extraordinary one that shows that by calculation, calculating the fluctuation in heat waves, thermal radiation, there is a particle and a wave component. So, was the problem resolved with this wave-particle duality? But does it resolve the problem? In my opinion, that's not the case. Once we have a concept, we need to find the images to go with it. And if we are looking for the images, we're going to come up against a few difficulties. We're going to encounter a few difficulties. Before looking at these conceptual difficulties, I would like to clarify some things. The quantum theory with its wave-particle duality is probably the most useful theory in the history of humanity because this wave-particle duality and the Schrodinger uh, equation, etc., and enables us to understand the stability of matter. Remember that at the end of the 19th century, physicists knew that matter had positive and negative charges, and that the positive and negative charges attracted each other, hence the question of why matter didn't collapse upon itself, and there was no classical explanation possible. It's through this wave-particle duality and that fact that if you try to confine the particle in an increasingly small space, you need to associate an increasingly short wavelengths and their increasing energy. And if you don't have that energy, you can't confine it beyond a certain point. And that is why the electrons do not collapse and do not crush in on the core. So matter is stability. Chemical bonds. How material emits light. 
All this gave rise to lasers, to transistors, to integrated circuits, and also to our information society that we have today, information and communication society. So once again, I emphasize quantum theory does have some conceptual issues, but it's been a huge success. So now for wave particle duality. The laser, for example. In a laser, you have billions and billions and billions of photons. And okay, so it's a wave, but you can represent that wave as having a statistical property formed by this number of photons. In the same way, when you have an electron, electronic current in a transistor, it's billions of electrons which are passing through, and you can say the wave aspect is a statistical representation of that whole, which therefore raises the question of whether this wave particle duality can be observed with a single particle. And this is the issue we addressed with Philippe Granger in the thesis of Philippe Granger. And if I could just correct something, in 1971, that was my dissertation on holography. It wasn't my, my uh, PhD thesis on the inequalities that got me, brought me my renown, was in 1983. So with Philippe Granger in 1985, roughly, we addressed the problem of whether we can observe wave particle duality for single particles. So here you see the experiment, which can be found in a certain number of physics manuals, physics books, which had never actually been done. So we have a source. It's a shame I don't have my computer. I could have shown you. Oh, we have a source, which image. I've got mine here, so here, and it's green, I like it. So we have the source emitting these particles, which are all identical. We put in two holes, and what this experiment shows is that if we move the detector, we see a modulation in the probability of presence. There are places where we have a not a lot of particles getting through, and others where there's none at all. Now I have to do this with two hands. And if we close one of the holes, we see no modulation, and you all know, therefore, that the only reasonable interpretation is to say that there is a single wave which has gone through both holes. Here we have a wavelet, and here we have a second wavelet, and if we're in the middle, the two wavelets arrive together, and if we move away from that position, we have a dark fringe, and that was all explained. I will skip over that. And so the conclusion of this is that to understand the black and white fringes, we can only refer to the wave uh, model of light. Has this been observed experimentally? The answer is no. And so in 1985, with Philippe Cranchier, we set uh, about doing an experimental study of this problem with a sort which had been invented to test the Bell inequalities and which we used to emit single photons. So imagine that you have a source here emitting single photons, and then we have two holes, the young holes here. I have two detectors behind it. If we are emitting single photons, what are we going to observe? We're going to observe that we're detecting either on the first side or on the second side, but not on both at the same time. However, if we have uh, a shadow, the wave goes both. Here we have a wavelet, here we have a second wavelet, and there you see that we have a certain probability of having simultaneous detection, because in the classical present explanation of this, it's proportional to the intensity of the light, and therefore how do we know if we're really emitting single particles or whether we have an indistinct flow of particles to be processed statistically. So if we have waves, we expect the probability of detection at the same time between the two deflectors being different from zero, whereas if we have particles, 
they can be observed either on one side or on the other, and the probability of the coincidence will be zero. These are just words, but words which can be demonstrated by uh, calculations. So the, abs the fact that there is no coincidence proves that we have a single photon source. So we didn't do the experiment with young uh, holes, but with a beam splitter, which is very similar here. We used a piece of glass. You have seen when there is a ray of light, of sunlight on the window, how it changes the angle. So here we have half which is transmitted, half which is reflected. If we have a single photon arriving here, it's a particle. It will go either one side or the other. And if it's a wave, the wave will be split in two. And as it's split in two, we will have a diff uh, probability of detection at the same time, which will not be zero. So here it's zero. Oh, sorry, I don't know how long I've spoken. My, my stopwatch seems to have stopped. I'm not sure how long I've been speaking for. Oh, 15 minutes. No, it's OK. I've just started again. I've still got 15 minutes left. So difference zero or non-zero difference. But how can we distinguish between zero and non-zero? For a mathematician, there's no problem. Zero is very different from not zero. But for an experimenter or a physicist, it's zero, but how much there are uncertainties in physics, and so we have to define things a bit more clearly. And so with Philippe Cangier, we defined a criterion, and this I'll show this here for those who understand the equations of physics. For the rest, you don't need to read it. When you go to a concert, you don't need to be able to read music. You just listen to the music, and here it's the same thing. Listen to me, and don't bother looking at the equations. So here we have a wave model of light. The probability of single detection is proportional to intensity, but the probability of joint detection is proportional to the intensity squared. And if we then have average values for that, we have uh, for the Schwarz uh, relationship here, which shows that the average of the square is greater or equal to the square of the mean. So if we do two or three small equations, we come to the conclusion that if we have a wave, the probability of joint detection is necessarily greater than or equal to the product of the probability of single detection, the one here and the one there. And therefore, there is a number, which is the ratio between the probability of joint detection and single detection, which is necessarily greater than or equal to 1 if we have a wave. But if we have a particle, it's 0 in an ideal case. But if there is noise and that noise is not too great, it will still be less than 1. And that is therefore the criterion for making the distinction between particles and waves. And it's very simple. We're going to emit single photons. And when we did these experiments in 1985, never had anyone created a source of single photons. But because if you're a bit naive, you say, how can I create a source of single photons? I'll take an atom, I'll excite it, and then wait. And sooner or later, it will have no choice. It will have to give us a single photon. Except that at the time, we now know how to do that. But in 1985, <laughs> I'm thinking of Fresnel, I keep saying 1800 rather than 1900, but I'm not that old. So in 1985, nobody was capable of isolating a single um, photon. So with Philippe Cangier, we had the idea to test the Bell inequalities. I had developed this source in which there were two photons, photons emitted in a cascade, one after the other, green, purple, green, purple. And it's a v with this, and between the two photons, the green and the purple, there's five nanoseconds. Whereas in average, there there is a photon every uh, thousand nanoseconds. So the idea was to say that if at the moment when we observe the green photon, in the few nanoseconds after it, we observe it, we will have a single photon. We can't have a second one. And this is how we constructed the first source of single photons, the first single photon emitter. And with this emitter, we did the experiment and we found that 
the alpha number was much lower than one. It wasn't exactly zero, but we understood that because there is noise and there are, uh, are different uh, interferences in the experiment. And we had a, a clear particle-like behavior. And so with this, we then asked ourselves the questions. So with this single photon, is it going to interfere? Is it going to interfere with itself? And for that, we built an interferometer in which we have the first semi-reflecting, and then with a, a mirror and a second mirror, then re recombine it. And here, if it's a wave, here, the recombination here will depend on the differences between the roots on one side and the other. If the two are of equal length, they will arrive at the same time in one of the two channels. And, but there are other factors that come into play. But once again, if the two rights are equal, it will all come up out on this side. If there's half a wavelength out of sync, it'll be part two. But if it's a particle, it will go either one way or the other. So we did the experiment, and with our single photon emitter, I won't go through the details, but we observed that when we move this mirror, when we vary the difference between the two paths, we do see a sinusoidal modulation, even though we're still working with the same single photon emitter. The experiment was done again in a modern way. Obviously, if I'd had my computer, I would have shown you, but here we're showing you PDF, so it's not the same. So here you see that 20 years later, we can now do this, we can have fluorescent molecules on a microscope slide, and if the solution is diluted enough, we can pinpoint a single fluorescent molecule, light it with a green laser, which emits red single photons, and with a dichroic mirror which reflects the red and lets the green through, which means we have a much simpler system for having a single photon emitter. I'd have been happy to show you, but we can't from my PDF file. The only thing I did want to show you is when we, they, when young people have done this experiment, Philippe Clanchy and myself, we were the godfathers of this experiment, but we have convinced people that instead of using young holes, they should use Fresnel by prisms, and I hope you appreciate that. And this is how the experiment was done with a Fresnel by prism. So if we forge ahead, this is where I would like to impress you. The first experiment is that we sent our single photons through this and detected either on one side or the other, but not both at the same time. So that's really a particle. Then with the same thing, but this time behaving as a wave, because when we move this mirror, we have a magnificent oscillation modulation here. So it's the same source, the same emitter, sending out the same parcels of waves, but with contradictory images. And this brings us to the central difficulty with optical physics. I'm go I'm go might need to skip a few slides because my watch seems to have stopped again. Uh, I, according to this, I, I, I've done 22 minutes. So we'll skip through that experiment, so just very quickly. Wheeler, so Bohr, so Bohr's complementarity. I'll do a quick explanation of Bohr's complementarity. What Bohr is said to have said, uh, there's no conceptual problem, because in the first experiment, if you ask the question, is it a particle or is it a particle? And in the second experiment, you ask the question, are you a wave? And the answer is, yes, I'm a wave. So why am I talking like this? It's because Bohr, with his complementarity theory, or philosophy, I should say more than theory, said that objects do not have a physical reality in themselves. They show 
a certain aspect of their physical reality or another aspect of their physical reality, depending on the question you ask them. And as you cannot ask the two questions simultaneously, you need to understand that if we compare this with something else, if you think of three dimensions, if I look on one side, I see one thing. If I look at, on the other side, I see something different. And it's the same depending on the question I ask. Either I get the wave response or I get the particle response. And if we follow this through to the end of the reasoning, it's the measuring instrument itself which creates the behavior. And then Wheeler comes along and says, but imagine if I haven't put it set up the second part of the experiment. So here, when the photon arrives here, it doesn't know what question we're going to be asking. And if it doesn't know what question we're going to be asking, how is it going to decide either to go on one side or the other, or to go on both sides at the same time? So it's Wheeler's delayed choice experiment. We did that. We were able to do that experiment and to show that at the moment, even though when the photons arrive, we haven't decided between the two setups, we have found an electronic way of introducing the devices after the arrival of the photon. And despite this, every time it behaves either as a particle or as a wave, depending on the setup. So now I'll move forward to, to, get, to sort of move on towards the end of my presentation. That was how Wheeler, who was a theoretician, saw the experiment. And he said, here we have galaxies. And with the delayed choice, we have lots of time because there's galaxies. And we did this over a distance of a few tens of meters. So wave particle duality is an, it's one of the great mysteries. The great Feynman himself addressed this wave particle duality is one of the great mysteries of quantum mechanics. So what do I say to my students when I teach these things to them? I say, first of all, the experimental facts force us to accept it. We can't discuss this. This wave particle duality has been demonstrated by experiments. But if you're really unhappy with this because of this conceptual contradiction, I can come up with some comments which should make things a bit easier for you. The first of these, and this is some, I point out to them that Quantum optics formalism gives a coherent account of the two viewpoints. We don't need to have a particle model on one side and a wave model on the other. The formalism of quantum optics is sufficiently sophisticated to cover the two viewpoints. And then, Bohr's complementarity is also interesting. The fact that you're obliged to choose either between the first setup or the second setup, obviously the fact that you need to make the choice when it's already been spoken brings us to another of my specialities, which I won't mention here. It's with quantum non-locality, so that even if we make the delayed choice, Bohr's complementarity is going to adapt to the situation. And that's why I say Bohr's complementarity allows us to avoid excessive inconsistencies. But I would like to, should not be interpreted in too naive a way. Finally, I would like to say that asking these questions leads us to innovations and to quantum technologies. And that's where that brings me back to Augustin Frenel, who came up with a theory which conceptually was extraordinary and was a wonderful innovator. So very, very briefly, I'm going to talk about quantum cryptography. Quantum cryptography. Is, so what's cryptography? It's two friends, Alice and Bob, who want to communicate between them without the spy, who is called Eve. Not out of misogyny, it's because somebody who listens in is, is it's an eavesdropper in English. So here you have Alice and Bob who want to communicate with each other and Eve, Eve who's trying to listen in on the message. And by using the fact that the photons you are sending here can are both single photons and can be detected only once. So the spy who is on the line, if they get the photon, they destroy it. But can detect this passing 
without d destroying it. Whereas Alice and Bob, what they do is that Alice is going to use the fact that the, it can behave as a wave in regard to polarization and the fact that we can consider this photon either as a superimposition, phased superimposition of two perpendicular or as a superimposition in a quadrature with a circular form and by switching between the two. So using the fact that the photon is not just a simple particle but can also interfere with itself, Alice and Bob are going to be able to get around the spy and the spy won't be able to decipher their secret code. This is actually applied. So here you have an application. You can even buy, from ID, ID Contique, you can even buy devices which are used by the Swiss for one of their great specialities, not cheese, not chocolate, but banking. So to communicate, the banks who are keen on their banking secrecy use this quantum cryptography. And they use this, so they are, obviously I want to, to, to be Swiss, fair with the Swiss. They also use this for voting. The elections, election results from the polling stations and the centers are transmitted by quantum cryptography in Switzerland also. It's not just banking information. So there is a startup called Candela, which is linked with Paris Sacré University, which does the single proton emitters. Here you have small microscopic article items from with Grangier. Our experiments used to fill three rooms, and now you have these tiny little technological devices. And if you want to buy a single photon emitter, these are the best ones in the world from Paris Sacré, and with this you can do quantum technologies. And what do I want to emphasize here? It's the fact that asking fundamental questions can lead to applications. And therefore, I would like to come back to the lesson we received from the great Fresnel, who was capable of producing this dissertation on the diffraction of light and at the same time all the theory of birefringence and polarization. And today, uh, I have marked the first page of this leaflet, which was published. I wrote the preface to this, for that matter, why I explained these two sides to Fresnel. It's the leaflet which was published for the launch of Fresnel Year, and we have the wave particle duality to quantum information and cryptography. And this really, I really would like to emphasize to all of you working in the world of lighthouses that you must be aware that this is one of the greatest theorists in optics. And when I am with physicists, I emphasize the importance of Fresnel's lens and his work on lighthouses, which we can see when we visit a lighthouse. Thank you very much for your attention. Minutes. Ça va? <laughs> so, 32 minutes. So, uh, <clears throat> wave particle duality, yes. a very, very interesting uh, topic. And I sensed from the very beginning that you were unstoppable. <laughs> so, uh, so, I let you have 30, 40 minutes or whatever it was. But, um, <clears throat> Uh, you you uh, you touched upon a, a number of very important things. Uh, the 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 multitude of uh, of um, uh, in, innovation from from Fresnel or, that uh, we build on today to a large extent, even in space measurements uh, and uh, in quantum theory, which uh, is the basis of uh, of electronics today, and it's mind blowing actually, really. And uh, you also mentioned something about the trustworthiness of, of sources, because uh, your page on Wikipedia said uh, what I said. It wasn't true. <laughs> there, was, there was no mathematical proof. And that is at the core of science. Uh, if you master the mathematics of it, and you can demonstrate uh, through mathematical modeling um, the, the physical phenomena you can observe. 
then you go a long way. So, um, next and final speaker of this session is uh, Malcolm Nicholson, an old friend and colleague for many, many years. Um, and he's a seasoned professional in the field of marine aster navigation, uh, 25 years of experience, and uh, he began in the very north of, uh, of uh, the United Kingdom in, at nor Northern Lighthouse Board, uh, moved to the south of the United Kingdom uh, to the Trinity House Lighthouse Service, the general lighthouse service of, uh, of UK and Ireland, actually. <clears throat> and uh, then, for some uh, obscure reason, he chose to move to Australia to work for a company <laughs> called Sea uh, Light, SPX, and there he is, um, what are you now? Product manager, responsible for managing and developing and developing an uh, extensive range of marine aton products. So um, early on, Melcom became a member of the Ayala Engineering Committee. Uh, particularly, uh, uh, he was involved in our work on light and vision, how the human eye perceives flashing, flashing lights. And this was at a time where uh, we were, uh, everybody in the world was switching from incandescent lamps um, to LEDs, light-emitting diodes, uh, quantum again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and it turned out that the model, the mathematical model we had for how the eye perceives these flashing lights was insufficient for this new technology. And therefore, uh, Malcolm is talking to us about the modification of, uh, or to Allard's law. He will explain. You have the floor. Uh, thanks, Omar. Uh, great to be here. Fantastic news for all of you. I have six slides. So I'm going to be um, pretty quick and I will definitely, definitely keep to time. Um, fantastic and very interesting presentations. Um, I want to follow the money a little bit, if I may, because that's how we all end up. So um, let me come back here. Um, for now, we'll develop the lens because we wanted to project light as far as we possibly could to make the waters as safe as we could so that sea captains would want a call at your port. That's where the money comes in. So when we promote lighthouses, um, we want to project light as far as we can. So we actually need to calculate and measure what that distance is. So when you provide a good system of aids to navigation, ships will want to call at your port, and that's where the money comes. So if we follow the money, we'll be okay. So following the money a little bit from uh, putting candles in lenses and trying to project light as far as you can, um, mm -hmm. some years later we wanted to quantify it and to measure it so we could publish it. Um, so Emil Allard um, had his formula for... Uh, oh. Okay. That's you. That's me. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's you. Yeah. That's good. So he published his formula um, whereby you wanted to calculate the illuminance at the eye for the signals that you were providing. Um, and that's quite a complex method. You, you can solve it you, using uh, newton raphson method. Well, if Newton was right, maybe not. Um, but you can solve it. But in practical terms, we want to rearrange it to calculate the intensity that we need for the range that we want to see the signal. So you take the minimum illuminance at the eye and multiply it by the distance squared, and then you divide it by how it passes through the atmosphere. And this transmissivity, as we call it, is basically a contrast of 5% to the power of 1 over the visibility. So to put that into a practical sum for you, um, Ayala recommend that the minimum illuminance at the eye for safe recognition of marine signals for colour and character should be 0.2 microlux, which is actually four times the threshold of a visual threshold. Can I see it? Can I not see it? 50%. Um, 
So it's quite a high level that we call super threshold. And we also know that if we fix the visibility for 10 nautical miles, this is what we call nominal range. And so we publish this in our list of lights and in our charts and in our books. And that is the range you can expect to see the light signal when the visibility is 10 nautical miles. So if we put that all into our lovely little formula here, of course we have to convert the illuminance into what we call C-mile candelas, which is about 0.69. We multiply it by the distance that we want to see it from, which in this case is 10 miles, divide it by the light that is lost over that transmission, we end up with approximately 1,380 candelas. So we can publish that and we can measure that. <clears throat> and that will give us a 10, mile, 10 nautical mile light in 10 miles visibility with a fixed light intensity. Now, as we developed optics and we started to rotate them, we started to have flashes of light. And flashes of light don't appear the same as a fixed light. So we had to come up with a method on how we calculate and measure effective intensity. And again, Allard proposed in 1876 in his memoir that I, I did read in French, uh, which is quite good fun, um, that the visual sensation in the eye for a flashing light, you can derive by this differential equation, uh, but the function that you have is a convolution. Uh, now, if ever any of you have heard the expression, that's very convoluted, this is where it comes from. It's an extremely difficult mathematical computation, and I'm even amazed they did it in 1876. Nowadays, of course, you can put it in a spreadsheet and it will calculate it in, in seconds. Uh, but to use this convolution method in 1876 uh, it was quite astonishing. Um, so his eye function, QT, is uh, the exponential of the time that you're seeing it divided by a visual constant. And what you do is you weigh um, that function across the flash profile of what you're seeing and you have this um, uh, resultant uh, convolution here where the peak is actually the effective intensity. So it's actually a lovely, lovely, simple model. Um, but of course, with everything and all physicists, they all argue with each other. Um, and then along came Bloch, um, not even 10 years later, and said, well, this doesn't work for temporal summation. Um, photographers such as this man here will know all about Bloch's law, uh, where the uh, response is, essentially the intensity multiplied by the time. A very simplistic model. And then some years later, Blondel Ray used Bloch's temporal summation as a basis for developing his very, very widely used method for calculation of effective intensity, which is the differential here um, divided by the visual constant plus the time that you kind of see it. So it, it makes it very, very easy um, you can almost do it in your head. You know, you can, you can take this previous example whereby we had um, our 10 miles fixed light of 1,380 candelas and you multiply it by the time that you want. It's on, 0.2 seconds, plus this visual time constant of A in your eye, how long you react to a flash of light divided by the time you see it. So you actually require a peak intensity, this here, of some 2,760 candela. So that's the kind of difference. So it's a very, very easy model to use um, uh, and not as complex or convoluted as convolution. <laughs> so very, very easy model. And so it was widely adopted because it was very easy to use. Um, that lasted some 50 years, uh, and then Professor Schmidt Clausen from Germany had a massive argument with Pierre Blaise at the Ayala conference in 1960, and some years later. Uh, but he, he won, Schmidt Clausen won. He introduced this form factor method, which is essentially a, an, an integration rather than a differential 
uh, of under the curve. And he came up with this form factor for F, or we use it as uh, G. <coughs> the amount of time you, you see the flash, candela seconds. Um, but they all agree with each other. So you take the time, again, in our previous uh, example of a 0.2 second flash, uh, you work through the math and you, you get exactly the same result. So Allard and Blondel Ray and Schmidt Clausen all agreed with each other. Until along came this idiot here, who spent many years in fields measuring lighthouses in situ with photometry, uh, along with a, my mentor and predecessor, Ian Tutt. Uh, we did hundreds of field measurements of lighthouses, uh, and we kind of figured there was a problem with Schmidt Clausen, that it overestimates somehow the effective intensity, particular for some of the flash profiles that we were looking at. So we uh, did a lot of research and uh, I found a, a paper, a Russian paper, to the Ayala conference in Washington from Luizov, who basically uh, took the original Allard function, but then he took Blondel Ray's temporal summation uh, and he made that the, uh, the function that you can use. So you see it here, which is the visual time constant divided by the visual time constant plus the time that you see it squared. Um, so we proposed, uh, myself and Ian proposed that um, to CIE and some much more cleverer mathematicians than both myself and Ian uh, came up with this model and this function uh, under Yoshi Ono, who was the president at the time, and Dennis Cousin, uh, uh, definitely credited with that. And this was adopted by Ayala uh, on the basis of a mathematical model, uh, but with a visual time constant of 0.2 seconds. And it's very important that all these different models agree with each other, uh, and you have to do a lot of visual experimentation um, to, to validate what it is you're doing. Um, so Ian and myself spent many years in a dark room with uh, flashing lights at unsuspecting students and visual observers um, to come up with it. One of the other things we felt that wasn't quite right and that we'd experienced um, visually in the field looking at flashing lights for years and years and years was this visual time constant of 0.2, 200 milliseconds how long your eye takes to respond to a flash of light is actually only value at, valid at threshold. When we talk about threshold, the 0 0.05 microlux, is it there, is it not there? And of course, when you raise that level of illuminance in the eye, it doesn't need as long to respond to that flash of light. That was my theory. Um, and thankfully, we were managed to carry out experiments um, <coughs> in, in Harwich and more laterally by Alwyn Williams, who was my successor at Trinity House. Um, and we concluded that a, a value of 0.1 second for the visual time constant at super threshold would be adequate and would work. Uh, and so we did all the experiment and we presented it to Ayala. And uh, that has now been adopted. So five years' work for 100 milliseconds is uh, not too bad, actually. Um, in practice, how does that benefit us? So because the modified Allard method agrees with all the other methods, you can use Blondel Ray um, to do your calculation. Okay, but instead of having an A of 0.2, you can have an A of 0.1. Uh, so this reduces your uh, peak intensity required for an effective intensity value here. So it gives you a reduction of 25%, which from a practical, either from a manufacturer's point of view or a service provider's point of view, a reduction of 25% in anything is an absolutely fantastic result. So you can save power uh, and you can generate better, better more conspicuous si signals. So my final 
uh, example is to use the example here. If uh, we want to um, have a, a five nautical mile light that flashes once every five seconds, so for half a second, um, that's what we call a 10% duty cycle. It's on 10% of the time, so we save power um, and while maintaining the range. If we use uh, an A of 0.2 seconds, we need 76 candelas peak, but if we use uh, a 0.1 A and reduce the flash by another 10%, we only need 68 candelas. So we can reduce the peak power and we can reduce the duty cycle. And that, what that does is it extends the lifetime of the signal that we're providing as well. Um, so I hope that's been a, of a little help and a little understanding. Uh, and that's where we follow the money. Thanks. Well, thank you, Malcolm. And of course, now you are a millionaire, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, so um, that brings this session to a closure. Let me just check the time. We we will take uh, one minute <laughs> for questions, or maybe two, if there are any questions. Is this all clear to you? I have a question. Who? Yeah? Uh, does your study... As a consequence for, I don't know the English word, the far occultation. So, yeah. Does also it change the way you can appreciate a far occultation? Yeah. You know what is far occultation? Oh. Can you translate for him? Far occultation. It means that you have a bright uh, lighthouse and from time to time you, you shut down the, yeah. the light. Occult occultation. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, well, how does your modified law changes also the situation for far occultation? Okay, uh, I, c I can try to answer that actually. Right. So, um, <clears throat> at the outset, when I introduced uh, Malcolm, I talked about the uh, the change from uh, incandescent lamps uh, to uh, LED. Land, uh, light sources and the difference in characteristics of these two types of light sources is that the incandescent lamp um, has a way has a the pulse the uh, light pulse has a, sh has a shape which is uh, like uh, gradually increasing and gradually decreasing and uh, and that uh, the eye perceives this in a particular way with its uh, 0 0.2 or 0 0.1 time constant the signal from the receptors in the brain, in the eye, into, into the neurons of the brain, it takes time. But uh, so, if the, sh if the sh shape of, of it is gradually increasing and um, uh, and reducing, it has a certain uh, um, effective uh, effectiveness. But uh, the LEDs, they ha have uh, a very sharp 10, 20 nanosecond uh, rise and fall. And that is therefore perceived co completely different by the brain. Uh, so what we heard from mariners uh, reporting back to um, um, H2 navigation providers was that these new lights they are much, much brighter than uh, the old lights. And uh, they're much more clear and crisp. And, uh, and that led to the thinking, that, okay, we're wasting, wasting power. We don't need uh, the range of the light is intended to be so long, 10 miles. And we are reaching 15 miles or whatever, and therefore we uh, we started working. That, that was actually the driver for for this work that Malcolm talked about. So um, uh, yes, it makes a difference. Yeah, I wish we had. Uh, I, I wish I had known who you were because we slept in the same cabin, not together, but in the same cabin. <laughs> and what a wonderful conversation we could have had yeah, last night. Sure. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yeah? Anybody? Yeah, there's one. Bonjour, c'est à Monsieur Aspect. Hello, this is a, this is a question for um, Mr. Aspect. Yes, yeah, just speak into the microphone, please. Anton uh, Zadiger's book on 
photons. Uh, did they work with you on that story, on that book? No, we worked on the same topic. We knew each other. When Anton Zeilinger said that he was working on, well, he was working on neutrons, he wanted to start working on photons, he actually sent some of his colleagues to my laboratory to learn about the techniques. So we worked on the same themes, but we did not directly cooperate or collaborate. But I just want to take advantage of this question to uh, tell you that I'm also preparing a book, which will be If Einstein Had Known, and it will be published a few months from now, uh, at the beginning of 2024, at the Odi Jacob, with the Odi Jacob publishers. So just a bit of advertising on my part since you give me the opportunity. Thank you. But anyway, as you can ask me all the questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, any other questions, please? Okay. Well, that uh, brings us to, to an end then. And uh, I have to, of course, thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity to be here and to uh, enjoy this fantastic session, actually, and the other sessions as well. Um, the audience for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be to with you, together with you, uh, enthusiasts, um, and also, of course, uh, my great speakers. Can we give them a, a round of applause? <laughs> not, not to mention, of course, Shak Masha, behind the scenes, makes everything work. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah. I think uh, now uh, w was to be the time of a, so a short coffee break. It's over, but I don't know what you want to do. The polls, yes. Uh, ten minutes coffee break? Yes. yes, ten minutes. We start in ten minutes again. Thank you. Yes.